Um, so can you tell you about this interesting piece here? This bowl here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's actually uh, a prize that I received. It's called the Sullivan Award. Mm -hmm. And it was given to me by the American Library Association for um, exemplary services to children mm -hmm. and youth in libraries. And so we just got this crystal bowl that was sitting here kind of empty. And we thought it would be a good idea to fill it up with M&Ms mm -hmm. and put it in the middle of the conference table. And it's become a terrific conversation piece mm -hmm. because whenever you have meetings, people come and just grab their share of M&Ms and, uh -huh. and it's a great conversation starter. Right. It is. I think it's lovely. It's way cool, yeah. huh? So, um, hi. We're at the main branch of SFPL with Luis Herrera. Luis, thank you for meeting with us. Um, as a former directive, director of SFPL, it's very important for us to include your perspective on how public libraries shape culture by providing access information and on how the system has been adapted over time. Our first question is related to the materials available. How does a library decide what books go on the shelves? Wow. Well, first of all, um, I've been just blessed to be uh, in this library profession uh, for about 40 years and served as city librarian for 13 years, so it's been wonderful. And, you know, Libraries are all about information, so first of all, we certainly have uh, books and materials that we select uh, to meet the needs of a very diverse community. Uh, but libraries have evolved and they're much more mm -hmm. than just a repository for books. It's about information, it's about learning, uh, knowledge, uh, and really access to information. Right. How do you think that like term has changed over time? Like what information meant in the 80s versus like now with the digital age, the internet? How has like that changed over your career working here? That's a great question. Um, I think information in the 80s uh, certainly had its limits in terms of formats and in terms of how you accessed information. You didn't have the internet. So libraries uh, became kind of the portal to the internet. And so I think there's uh, a much broader array of information. There's been what we call the information explosion. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to make sense of it. And so libraries have been a place where you can literally evaluate and assess information so that you're not just bombarded with a bunch of mm -hmm. data and yeah. stuff that doesn't mean anything. Right. So they have evolved and I think it's much more um, important that we literally authenticate and we understand how to evaluate and how to find what you need. So um, in terms of data, could you tell us about numbers? Mm -hmm. How many visitors, visitors does the library have a year? And is this number increasing or decreasing? You know, we have a little bit uh, under 7 million visitors a year. Wow. That's a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and the numbers have actually declined mm -hmm. a little. Uh, the biggest area where we've shown tremendous growth is in people coming to the library and all our libraries for programs, mm -hmm. a variety of programs, whether it's lectures or children wanting to participate in story time or crafts programs or uh, senior adults wanting to learn how to use computers. Those programs are really our biggest share of people coming to a library. That's interesting. Do you think it was like the libraries pushing and adding programming that started that or did people like was there an increased demand and then the library just met that demand I think it's a little bit of both okay. I think I think folks uh, go to libraries because they want to learn mm -hmm. and they see that the library does offer a variety of programs to meet different kind of needs for you know different ages and demographics um, I also think that our librarians have positioned themselves to respond to what we feel the community wants. Mm -hmm. And so it's a little bit of demand versus what we think is innovative in terms of programs. But as I said, um, our programs are tremendous and, and very innovative. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, what is the work and role of librarians in the San Francisco public library system? And how are they involved with the materials that they handle? Well, I think the role for 
the librarians are kind of information brokers. They um, help guide you to meet your own personal needs, whether it's finding a book on a specific topic that you feel you, you want to read. Uh, there's such a thing as readers' advisors where they literally give you uh, expert uh, recommendations on the interest or the subjects that you want to pursue. Uh, but they also help you navigate information uh, that, you know, if you're interested in information about health or information about a career or a business, uh, they're experts at using databases and other tools to help you navigate this huge um, arena of information. Interesting. Um, libraries in San Francisco have been characterized by multicultural Multi multiculturalism. Okay. Libraries in San Francisco are characterized by multiculturalism. How is this promoted, and how do you have you perceived the patrons' population changing in re in this regard? Well, first of all, uh, we live in a in a city and a region where um, we value diversity, and by virtue of that, I mean our staff is well. Uh, equipped to be able to meet the language and linguistic needs, uh, the different uh, materials in a vast um, variety of languages. Uh, we're an international city in many regards, so we want to respond to different communities. It's not a one-size-fits-all approach to information uh, access. And so I think we're very proud of um, making sure that we meet the needs of um, all of our constituencies. Does that, does that make sense to you? It does, yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah, so uh, our librarians have speak different languages. I mean, I think I would say our librarians might speak in 20 languages, oh, wow. you know, a variety of uh -huh. expertise. Um, our city has a very strong policy on language access mm -hmm. so that our information is always um, translate it so that if you speak Tagalog or Chinese, Mandarin, Cantonese, whatever the languages are, Spanish, uh, even Russian, uh, we make sure that we have staff that can respond in those languages. That's great. Do you, do you ever find it difficult to find like someone who's knowledgeable in a certain area that might be like not well known? Yeah, there are some areas that are a little bit more uh, specialized, if you will, where we may not have a staff member that might speak that language. Uh, or uh, sometimes we find it a challenge to find materials in a specific mm -hmm. culture or language. Uh, but we even have librarians travel across the world to uh, book fairs. Wow. Uh, for example, um, there's a book fair in Russia or in Guadalajara in, in Mexico uh, or in China where we send librarians to literally um, buy books in those specific languages and then bring them back to San Francisco. And we're very fortunate to be able to have the capacity to do that. That's interesting. Yeah. I guess that leads into the question, how does the library decide what sort of information it wants to put on its shelves? Well, we're uh, very inclusive. So uh, we have librarians that have expertise in different subjects mm -hmm. uh, and they select materials in a broad range of subjects to meet the community demands. Uh, we uh, review books, mm -hmm. there's journals, there's uh, publishing tools that help us look through the list of new publications, new books, uh, and it's, it's a, hundreds of thousands of books each year are published. So we have to, with the resources we have, narrow that down. And our librarians uh, are very good about making decisions about which books to purchase, where the demand is from our community, um, and again, a variety of formats. It's not just all printed mm -hmm. materials. It's databases, it's e-books, um, audio books, all sorts of formats to meet the demands of our reading public. Has there ever been anyone who's been banned from the library? Anyone that's been banned from the library. We are welcoming to all. 
as a matter of fact, we have a, a major campaign that we say all are welcome. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't pass judgment. It's, it's free for all. We're very proud of that as our core value. Uh, the only requirement is that you abide by the patron code of conduct that you uh, follow the guidelines of decorum and make sure that you behave appropriately. Mm -hmm. So there are some instances where uh, people bring some of their personal issues, uh, whether it's mental health or whether it's uh, um, any kind of circumstance that they overtly misbehave, mm -hmm. then we do ask them to correct that behavior, mm -hmm. otherwise they're asked to leave. But the key point here is that everybody is welcome. And on any given day at this main library, we have up to 5,000 people uh, from all walks of life, and that's the beauty of the public library. Um, are there any special positive, positive situations that you recall during your time at the libraries, either with the book collections, the staff, or the patrons? There's a lot of wonderful things that happened during my, my tenure here. Uh, one of the things we're very proud of is that we were the first library in the nation that uh, hired a full-time social worker. And that social worker actually um, meets the needs of people that might need housing. They might meet, need a referral to a social service agency. Uh, for whatever the circumstance is, we have an amazing um, social worker that helps meet the needs of our community. And other libraries actually began to follow suit and, and replicate this program. So we're very proud of that. Um, we're also uh, very proud of our innovative programs that we've had. Uh, we have a, a food cart called Biblio Bistro that actually um, has one of our librarians that was a culinary chef uh, that uh, takes this food cart to some of our neighborhoods and the farmer's market and teaches people about nutrition uh, and health. And so it's become a very popular, uh, actually an award-winning program. We've also had a great partnership with the National Park Service where our summer reading program for young people uh, had a record-breaking number of participants, almost 28,000, because this partnership allowed for shuttles to transport families from our neighborhood libraries to um, national parks. And that became a, a tremendously successful program for both the National Park Service and uh, the library. We're also very proud of our partnerships with the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Our, our public knowledge program uh, is engaging the community with art and uh, books and information, and uh, that program is also very successful. That's great. Um, I really enjoyed hearing about the, the librarian with the culinary yeah. background. Are the, there any other like, instances you know of like that where a librarian incorporates another interest of theirs into their work? Yes. Uh, there's another person that is our uh, environmental center librarian. And she works with the uh, Department of the Environment on what they call these um, bio excursions, where they're actually taking uh, communities and, and teaching them about biodiversity uh, and the environment. So this is another example where this person is very interested in, in sustainability and the environment. And so she took that expertise and has programs that literally teach people about carbon footprint or how to reduce uh, emissions and, and what have you. And it's really a wonderful program that uh, we're very proud of. So that's another one. Mm -hmm. And then certainly one of the programs that we're very proud of is the Teen Digital Media Center, The Mix, mm -hmm. where uh, young adults literally uh, design that space with the architect so that they have a creative outlet for digital learning, uh, for videography, uh, for all sorts of technology, uh, and uh, it's been a tremendously successful place here at the library. Um, what comes to your mind if we mention censorship in relation to the libraries? Does it exist? Censorship, does censorship exist? 
I would say that one of our core values is intellectual freedom, mm -hmm. where we uh, welcome uh, different points of view and different perspectives. Uh, so we take great pride in being a place where uh, we're neutral in any kind of um, viewpoint, uh, whether it's political, whether it's religious. Uh, I think that uh, we don't censor. I think we're, we're very free for um, expressing a variety of opinions and ideas. And we have a lot of programs where uh, we bring in panels to talk about different topics uh, that resonate with the community. But uh, censorship is uh, an, an area where we definitely want to make sure that we subscribe to an open and intellectual freedom environment. That's great. What do you think could endanger the current network, network of libraries and the social services that they also represent, if anything? Um, so tell me a little bit more about what, what you mean by endanger. Like, like uh, anything that might hinder access of information, because you mentioned like your librarians as being information brokers, mm -hmm. anything mm -hmm. that might hinder that connection, I guess. Well, I think you know this this time, this political climate, where we talk about fake news and we talk about um, uh, you know there's elements out there that would uh, pose some threats to authenticity, and I think that there is always a possibility of of um, making sure that we validate information, that we uh, are libraries that should be very um, aware of the fact that you know not everything is factual, uh, that there are some um, sources that may not be legitimate and authentic. So our librarians are even more important now to ensure uh, that um, information is carefully vetted uh, to ensure that it's not what we call fake news or that uh, the sources are in fact legitimate. I hope that answers your question yeah. because that's a, that's a very important mm -hmm. question right. uh, in terms of libraries. And the libraries have always played a, a, a vital role to ensure factual information. Okay. Yeah. I guess my last question might be what like what service does the library present that not a lot of people know about, but could certainly like take advantage of? Um, there's, I still get questions from people that say like, do we need libraries, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely, uh, more than ever. Uh, access to information and ensuring equity of information mm -hmm. to all communities uh, is a cornerstone of libraries. We're probably one of the most democratic institutions uh, in the country mm -hmm. uh, to ensure equal access for everybody. Um, but I also think I get the question of people saying, I didn't know that the library did this, right? There's a lot of programs, um, a lot of wonderful opportunities for learning, and the most important thing is that it's free, mm -hmm. right? Uh, who would have thought that you could actually get a high school diploma, a fully certified high school diploma at the library uh, simply by, um, through an online platform that's certified. So we have a career online high school. That's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Um, there's opportunities to learn so much, um, and this is a place where it's um, a free university, if you will, for anyone in, in our community, open to all. Great. Thank you so much for answering our questions. It's my pleasure, Kelly. Really enjoyed it. All right. Thanks.